Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito for holding this hearing today, and Dr. Freeman, thank you for joining us. I have a few examples behind me of chemicals that have undergone the TOSCA process, which are critical for global, global food production. Formaldehyde is necessary for livestock, livestock production to prevent disease. And while you all may know that Nebraska is the beef state, Something you may not know is that the, we are also the global leader in irrigation system production, such as what you see here is a, a center pivot. Actually, about 80% of all the world's center pivots are made in, in, in Nebraska. And vinyl chloride is critical for the irrigation tubing, hoses, and drip lines. Uh, both ethylene oxide and acetaldehyde are used in the production of crop protection tools, protecting our food supply from insects and disease. And these examples uh, really exemplify the importance of predictable and reliable permittance of chemicals. As governor of Nebraska, I implemented Lean Six Sigma for our state agencies to improve our processes. And my understanding is the Trump administration uh, established an Office of Continuous Improvement at the EPA to implement the Lean program with the EPA, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, Dr. Freeman. Um, and this is, again, just really, I'm just looking for a simple yes or no on these. Um, does the new chemicals program still utilize the lean program? No, but we do seek to continuously improve through many of the same approaches that are in lean six, 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 six sigma. And, and does the Office of Continuous Improvement still exist at the EPA? That I'm not sure about, but I know there are agency-wide conversations about ways to improve our processes and those and when one off one part of EPA comes up with something, it's actually shared throughout the agency. Well there are clearly other process improvement methodologies besides Lean Six Sigma, mm -hmm. but if you could follow up with me on the Office of Continuous sure. Improvements if that is still exists at the EPA. Uh, also we've heard that one of the problems holding up uh, PMNs are uh, changes to the staff contacts mm -hmm. uh, throughout the process. If a new project manager is assigned to a PMN, will you commit that to us that that project manager will then notify the submitter within a week to let them know that there's been a change? You know, I think that's an incredibly reasonable idea, and we'd be happy to do that. I think that would improve transparency for everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. Um, the EPA issues existing chemical exposure limits, in other words, regulating chemicals throughout the workplace exposures. However, there are multiple times more stringent than the, the rest of the world. Uh, these limits are based on information from EPA's Integrated Risk Information System, or IRIS program, which is not congressionally authorized and is a hazards-based program. Uh, this is not consistent with the agency's statutory mandate to complete risk-based chemical reviews using the best available science. Uh, not, only, uh, not to mention that OSHA already is completing the work on this through some of their enforceable permission exposure limits. In addition, to the, um, uh, in addition, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists established exposure limits far above EPA's ECHLs. Um, these values are regularly updated following industry standardization practices. For many of the chemicals under EPA review, including asbestos, um, methylene, chloride, uh, okay, this one, per, I'm going to biology major, perchloroethylene, carbon tetrachloride, and trichloroethylene, the Eccles Would you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did about as good as I could the first time through. Uh, the Eccles have come out after the proposed and final risk evaluation. Some with proposed risk management rules, uh, so, oh, some with proposed mismanagement rules, which left stakeholders with no real opportunity to comment on these levels. This is a significant problem, is compounded by the fact that these numbers are extremely low, often below the level of detection, and much lower than regulatory numbers in the rest of the world, as we kind of mentioned. Uh, setting levels below the level of detection is de, de facto a ban on these chemicals. For clarification, when you set a final regulatory echo for industrial uses, does that mean there is a level at which no unreasonable risk exists? I think what we're saying for some of those levels is that the proposed exposure levels that came out um, address the unreasonable risk that was identified in the risk evaluation. But it's important to understand that the risk evaluations are prohibited by law from considering costs and other non-risk factors, like the point you made about them being unimplementable. So I think as we move through the regulatory process, 
following the risk evaluations, we're engaging pretty actively with industry to make sure that we really understand what their occupational sa safety practices are, you know, can achieve. And I think you'll see some shifts in, in our approaches between proposed and final rules for some of the chemicals. Okay, thanks. So if I understand what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the process that's been set up and the rules have been established and the law has been passed actually make it so that you recommend some of the detection, some of the risk levels below detection level because you're not allowed to consider other factors? Is that accurate? Not, not quite. In the risk evaluations, we're not supposed to be considering costs or other non-risk factors. When we write rules, we 100% consider those things. So I think in an exchange I had earlier with, with Senator Bozeman, I believe it was, you know, we, if we get, going forward, you know, if, if we get a draft risk evaluation that leads to a math outcome that the draft proposed occupational safety limit is below background levels for that chemical, we'll say very clearly in the draft risk evaluation that that number won't be the basis of our rule. Okay, so it's not a de facto ban in that case, then? No. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Freeman. I appreciate you explaining that.